Good evening, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this webinar on how to move to Australia, how to migrate to Australia. My name is Scott Matheson. I'm the co-founder of Working In, and we've got some great panellists here today to help you uh, realise your dream of, of migrating to Australia. Now is an amazing time to do it. We're kind of over COVID in so many respects. The borders opened in Australia yesterday. And my word, what an exciting time we have uh, for those people that just feel like that this is the time and this is the time. Um, real experts here today. And so I'm just going to get straight in and introduce you all. We've got um, our agent in South Africa, uh, Anita Matthews, who's based in Joburg. Anita, if you could introduce yourself, please. Yes. Hi. Good evening. Claire Nant, my fellow South Africans. My name is Anita Matthews and I'm based here in Johannesburg and my role here is to hold your hand through this exciting journey. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. And uh, working at, we have uh, people similar to Anita in the UK as well. So if we're ever needing to talk to somebody, um, then we have UK-based consultants, South Africa-based consultants. And uh, moving down to Sydney, we have Brett McAdam, who's our employment specialist. Brett, if you could just introduce yourself, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brett. Um, I work in recruitment, so I help employers connect with international people moving to Australia. Um, I've been in the recruitment industry for nearly 10 plus years now, working across a range of industries in Australia. Um, yeah, that's me. Fantastic. Fantastic. Brett, yeah, Brett talks to a lot of employers, and, and Australia has a really good understanding of the employment market, so somebody that you might be talking to in the future. And then finally, um, our Head of Immigration in um, Australia, our resident Mara agent, Nazim Malazari. Nazim. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning, good evening. Um, my name's Nassim. I'm a registered migration agent and I've been with Working In for 11 years. Um, over that time, I've helped thousands of individuals make them move down under and I'm looking forward to speaking to everybody tonight about what those opportunities look like now. Thanks. Thanks, Nazim. Born in Chicago, raised in Sydney, um, uh, and I uh, understand the whole entire migrant story, as we'll get to later. Um, and my name is Scott Matheson, as I mentioned, I'm the co-founder of Working And We've been helping people move to Australia now for over 20 years. Um, we used to run very large employment migration expos in the UK and South Africa. Um, and, you know, we started those in 2001. So we have literally been helping tens of thousands of people over the last two decades. It's something we love doing. Uh, we're going to continue doing it. Um, but now I will say is probably the most interesting time we've ever seen. There's so much opportunity um, for people who want to migrate. The skills and need are um, unbelievable. Um, but the process is probably more complex than it's ever been. So it's really important to understand how you get there before you start on the journey in case you go down the wrong path, which costs money and time, and you may not ever arrive there. So planning is number one. That's what we'll be covering off today. Um, and you know, uh, uh, we'll also get uh, into the sort of the, uh, the job market, what's happening now, and, and, and some of those routes that um, could be available to you if you don't meet the, 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 the slam dunk criteria, as, as we say. So first of all, I'll just go over to Anita, though, who's based in Joburg. You're talking to eight, ten people a day. What's, what's the mood? Yeah, people are pretty excited about they've been waiting for two years. I mean, some of, of um, people I'm talking to has actually started this process just before COVID and then had to put it on hold. And they are super excited that they can pick it up from where they are right now. And um, as my fellow South Africans probably know, the headlines in our Biggest newspaper on Saturday was it is probably the sec second biggest brain drain that South Africa would see um, in a long time, and the reasons for that is very clear. And it's stated there: you we have we had a major unrest in July, which has made a lot of people motivated to move. Economy uncertainty, but then in general, it's just people are looking for new adventures. And one thing that COVID has taught us over the last eighteen two years is that you can work remotely. So. People are starting to open up and knowing that, hey, I don't have to work in South Africa. I can have a life somewhere else. And, um, you know, Australia is certain one of them. And I think one of the biggest factors for people is new opportunities um, that they want to explore. And especially if they two a couple with young children um, and want to start a new life. And um, I've just seen over the last two weeks a major uptake and in interest um, in the people that I'm speaking to 
very serious, um, highly, and it's very exciting to see. Thanks, Anita. That's all. It's all very positive, and you know that's the feeling that we're getting from all the inquiries. Um, just a, a surge, really. Um, and Brett, you know, you're on the ground there, and uh, the borders opened yesterday. There's, uh, Scott Morrison was uh, very, very visible on all the sort of the social networks. So, what's what's the feeling in Sydney? Yeah, look, I mean, it's pretty exciting here. Uh, you would have seen in the news yesterday or was it Monday this week, we opened back up to tourists. Uh, which are coming into New South Wales. Um, so obviously a lot of scenes at the airport, people arriving, but also restrictions are getting dropped right across the country. Um, you know, Western Australia is kind of the last sort of um, big sort of uh, spot and they've announced recently that they are going to be um, lifting their border restrictions on the 2nd or 3rd of March, one of the two. Um, yeah, so they'll be opening back up again. But the overall... The mood in Australia, look, you know, they have to cry out for people left, right and centre across multiple industries, be it construction, mining, hospitality. Um, you hear a bit on the news, but I mean, I can walk out of my house at the moment and see signs up outside restaurants help wanted. So it's it's pretty visible, um, the impact um, Australia being shut off on the rest of the world the last two years has been. Um, so I think there's generally a lot of optimism, a lot of excitement that after nearly two years, we're opening back up fully to the world again and people are coming back down. So, you know, a lot of people are pretty excited to see people come back for a number of reasons. Yeah, fantastic, Brett. I mean, that, that does say it all. Um, you know, just to explain what's happened in Australia over the last two years when um, COVID arrived and the borders shut. I mean, Australia has been reliant on immigration for decades and so when that um, when that train of people stopped coming into the country it created a skills shortage also a lot of people that were here in 2020 and March 2020 as soon as COVID came they weren't necessarily on permanent visas they might have been on the 482 uh, short-term four-year temporary visa um, and so hundreds of thousands literally left and went back home and, you know, those are the people that worked in the restaurants and they worked in the agricultural horticulture industry um, and, and they've gone. And so there's a real shortage now, a bigger shortage uh, of people in the, in the in the workforce than we've actually seen in, in decades. What does this mean? And Nazim's going to get into this, but um, well, obviously most people when they come to Australia want to work, <laughs> but for many, employment is the key to unlocking the immigration door. So uh, right now, because the job market is so fertile, it's a real opportunity to be able to uh, use that uh, platform to, 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 to get into Australia through immigration. So I think Nazim can explain this better than I can. Um, maybe you can just start with an overview of how the migration system works and, you know, the 189, 190 and all those numbers, Nazim, and uh, let's just lay it out and try and be as clear as possible. Sure. So um, obviously um, anyone who's done any research into Australian immigration will know that the government likes to give different visa um, numbers rather than names. So they're referred to um, as subclass 189, 190, 482, 491. So all of these different numbers represent a different visa subclass, which will give you different um rights and also obligations. So what happens is, is that some will have a job requirement tied to them, but there's also quite a few that don't. When we're assessing people and their ability to move to and migrate to Australia, we assess under all of the ones that you can see up on the screen. What we're trying to determine first and foremost is that you qualify for the visa that has the most options for you and your family. So if you've got um, an occupation on the medium to long-term skills shortage list and you meet the other points requirements, potentially you qualify for a subclass 189. That allows you to move to Australia, to live and work anywhere in the country that you like, doing anything that you would like to do. So even if you get a visa as an electrician, you don't need to work as an electrician and you can work for anyone, including yourself. When you go down the list, you've got a subclass 190, this requires that you're um, sponsored by a state or territory. Sometimes there is a requirement that you have an offer of employment or you're already in the state because of 
whatever reason um, for that state and your occupation, but generally you don't. And again, a job offer is not normally required in order to qualify for this visa. The condition with this visa is that you're committing to a specific state. So the great thing about Australia is it's a massive country and the state is huge. So it's not like you're suddenly um, promising to live within four square metres. You've got thousands and thousands of miles of, you know, jobs and schools and um, all sorts of opportunities in which to establish a new life. Going further down, we've got a skilled employer sponsored regional visa. This one's obviously specifically related to employment. You need a job offer from an employer in a regional area in order to apply for that visa. So these are just a couple. There's a whole lot of other ones. Um, we have the 482 that Scott referred to earlier, which is a, a work visa, but that's a short term temporary one and it doesn't necessarily lead to residence, but sometimes it does. So because there's so many different options, and this is just a couple, like there's literally hundreds of subclasses, when we assess you and your family's options, we're looking to see which ones you can fit into um, easily, but also if there's any that you could potentially also fit into with a little bit of extra work experience or if we have a little bit more detail about your qualifications. And, and that just means that you've got then all the answers as to which which opportunities you should look at and which ones you should then go after as part of your move to Australia. Oh, look, that's, um, that's really good information. So just to clarify, um, the, you, you can get into Australia without a job, which is pretty amazing, but the criteria is steep and it's specific jobs. Um, if you don't meet that, you can, you can potentially get into a specific state without a job offer. And if you don't meet that, there is the job led, what we call the job led, which is if you can find a job, you can find an employer, then you can potentially go down that route as well. And those are kind of like the three main angles. And then off all that, there's various scenarios depending on what your experience, uh, your qualifications, what, what, are, what are the other sort of... Um, your age. Yeah, uh, talking about age, uh, some people are already asking on the chat. And please ask questions on the chat. If we can't get to you straight away, we will get to you. Uh, even if it's after the webinar, um, the age for limit for Australia is is what Nazim. So for most of the skilled visa subclasses, so this is permanent residence, you need to be forty five years of age or younger, or qualify for an age exemption. So someone's asked the question, "What about a work visa?" There's no limit on work visas. The only exception being the work and holiday visa, which is for young people coming as tourists with work rights. But employer-led specific visas um, that are temporary, there is no age limit. So if you're over 45, the number of opportunities is limited, but it doesn't mean that there's none. And that's part of what we do is we look to see what those opportunities for you might be, what they look like, um, and, and will they lead to residence, uh, permanent residence for you and your family? That's something that, you, that you're interested in knowing. Yeah, fantastic. So um, we do have a free eligibility uh, assessment form. Uh, it's a link that you can click on. You can go through, you can complete all your details. And Nazim and her team will just look at that and, and give you an indicative idea as to whether we think that you will be meet the criteria or not. And if you don't, then you know, what, what needs to be done? Um, if you do meet the criteria, then there is the opportunity to um, spend a little bit of money, about 200 pounds, UK pounds, so just under 4,000 rand, um, to get a full eligibility assessment. And that's a really, really, really detailed report that will kind of map out your entire pathway and, and go through what um, Nassim's just been talking about. Am I on the 190, the 189? Is it uh, a temporary visa first? Um, but all this stuff is what we call the insurance policy. Spend a little bit of money, get the full report, and then you know your options. Um, Anita, I mean, you're talking to people a lot who are, who are taking this option. Um, how do they feel when they get the report? I mean, is that something that is valuable? Yeah, I, I'm very valuable. I've just this, this evening before we had um, this webinar, I contacted a few people that's already filled in um, the assessment form and has had the consultation and they just said it was just so clear for him after they had the consultation as you say it's that insurance policy and just having that clarity 
you know, that, and you understand what it is you need to do hereafter, because as we know, this is a major project you have to take on. And for a major project, you need a major plan and you can't plan unless you have all that information. So I think after the report, the most valuable thing is that 45 minute hour consultation that a candidate has with one of our consult uh, um, licensed migration agents and just give them that assurance and, and clarity on what it takes to immigrate to Australia. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I, you know, I, do, I, I do agree. Having a plan that's concrete right from the get go is amazing. Um, you know, one of the things that we notice is that there's a lot of chatter on different channels, on different groups. And um, it's, it's amazing how much information is incorrect. So um, Nassim will be nodding her head here. Um, I just, uh, you know, whether you use us or not, um, just that first part is, is something that it's highly valuable. Now, if you don't meet the 189, 190 um, criteria, and I was going to ask you one question then, Nazim. If you have to, what do you mean by committing to a state? Because that sounds a little bit scary on one level. Can you just explain that in a little bit more detail? Because a lot of people will meet, will be in that bracket. Yeah. So um, to meet the subclass 190, you're exchanging um, your commitment to live and work in that state for several years after the grant of the visa in exchange for the five points and the auto almost automatic selection that that state provides you with. So what the governments, the state governments don't want you to do is to take their limited spots because they're only allocated a certain number of places every year from the federal government in order to nominate people for state sponsorship. They want to give that to you if you're going to go and live somewhere else. They want you to come and live in that state um, as an exchange for that, you, basically your, your permanent resident visa. So part of that includes that you will, depending on the state, you'll, you'll complete annual sort of questionnaires, you'll update them with, you know, what's working well or not. It's quite general and it's not necessarily tied to you specifically. But what they're looking to see is that the people that they do sponsor and they do nominate, do come, do settle and then do well. Those state governments have identified, for example, that we need, I don't know, 10 teachers, 16 nurses and five, I don't know, fire engine engineers. <laughs> if they've identified that those are the skills that they need in their state and then they sponsor you, they want to make sure that those skills are in the state for the benefit of the state. So that's why there's that commitment from, from you. Obviously, the way it's policed is not very, very well from the state or federal governments. And it generally doesn't become a big problem until people apply for citizenship, but your intention should be to stay in that state. Yeah, look, and I think and a subsidiary question to that, and maybe I can um, ask Brett this, but people are saying, well, if I get that state sponsorship and I move over to Australia without a job, how easy is it to find a job? So Nazim, probably the first part is um, the government set this up so jobs that are in demand meet that criteria. So in all likelihood, you should get a job, right? Correct. Um, and then, Brett, from your perspective, you know, what's the attitude of employers if you're here basically with a permanent residency visa? How, you know, how does that work? I mean, are you treated the same as somebody on the ground here already? Yeah, pretty much, Scott. I mean, if someone's already got that arranged, obviously it takes a lot of legwork out from the employer's perspective to have to take them through. The visa process themselves. They were, um, so look, they are would be looked at very, if not exactly the same as someone already on the ground, you know, Australian citizen. If they have that sorted, you now applying to jobs, they've obviously got some pretty key skills and uh, qualifications that are sought after over here anyway. So it puts them in a really good spot. Yeah. And then of course you know a number of employers as well. So if anybody gets to that point and get to shoot the visa then. Uh, Absolutely, we want to hear from them. Um, so, you know, don't be shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and look, you know, we do do a lot of uh, organisation of interviews from people are offshore and, and oftentimes jobs are offered prior to arrival. Um, but you need to be a well, well, well down the track with your visa application before. Uh, employers are interested because even Brett, yesterday you talked about the fact that the timelines are so long 
you know, the timing of when you talk to the employer is critical and you don't want to do that too early in the piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I mean, I do hear people reach out to me and say, hey, I'm thinking of coming down and, you know, at Christmas after Christmas sort of thing, 12 months out. And it's just too soon to hit the market, talking to employers on your behalf. Um, to re- it is a lot of timing that you're sort of down that road um, and have a, a roadmap, so to speak, in place of when you come into Australia dates. Um, you know, you need to be pretty firm around that as well to be able to get that conversation of an employer, definitely. Yeah, everyone wants clarity, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so again, it comes down to planning. And I can see that somebody on the chat has said, well, how long does it, you know, does the process take for applying for a visa on average? Well, obviously, it depends on it, on on each visa. But Nazim, can you give us some indicatives around that? Because I think that's a really important part of the planning. It's hard to give a general period of time because it's like asking how long a piece of string is, depending on your country of citizenship, where you're physically located, what your occupation is, which visa subclass you're applying for, do you need a skills assessment, do you need to do an English language test, does the employer need to apply for standard business sponsorship before they can nominate you, is your occupation on a priority list, which visa process are you going through? Do you need to apply for additional steps along the way, including registration? What about, you know, state sponsorship? So there's it's actually quite a, a very, very broad range. Um, so I like to tell people it'll be anywhere between one day and 18 months, depending on the subclass. So unfortunately, I can't be very specific, but that's part of why we do those appraisals. Depending on the pathway that we've identified in your specific circumstances, I'll be able to say for this visa, you should roughly assign on eight months. For this one, it's going to take three days. This other one might take, you know, eight months. And that way we can, you know, we can better advise. Um, A lot of times people forget that there's a lot of pre-work and that takes time before the actual visa processing time. So the visa processing time might only be, you know, six to 12 months for like a permanent residency application. But what about all the things you needed to do before and how quickly did you do those to get to the lodgement stage? Sorry, I can't be very specific. (laughs) Well, look, I think that is true. Um, You know, in our experience, it is preparation that takes the most time Um, and the requirements, the the document requirements, uh, the original certificates, the... The, the, the qualifications, maybe IELTS for those that are not from English uh, speaking countries, the, these do take time. Um, and I guess it's part about ordering well, what are the things that I actually need to do first because they're going to take the longest. I think that's a really important part of this planning stage that would come out when we do your assessment. So you know, well, I need to start this right now. You know, some police certificates from some countries can take six months or more, um, for, for, for instance. So yes, that's, uh, I think that's part of it. And, and Nazim's absolutely right. Um, for some visas, they can be processed you know, in under a month, um, but it's not the actual processing time of the Australian government that is the, is the important part. It's actually the preparation time on your behalf. So uh, I guess ju- I just, I'm just reiterating, horses for courses, every single person is unique and different here. And your scenario, we can't even estimate how long it's going to take until we actually understand, you know, are you coming by yourself? Do you have a partner? Do you have kids? You know, what is their medical condition? What's their age? And and almost a, you know, a never ending uh, number of questions to understand and better plan that pathway for you. Um, So, look, I just want to come back to you, Nassim, on that matter. What, what, What are the things that you find normally trip people up in this whole process what are the things that slow things down what can people be doing now that will help them prepare other than doing our you know eligibility assessment are there some key things yeah um i think what's really really important is that if people decide first and foremost that they're wanting to make the move that they actually start the process stopping and starting it doesn't help If you are going to start, you need to commit and you need to push through with it because different parts of the process might have different validity. And if you are just trying bits and pieces of it out, you're spending time and money that you can't necessarily get back. You're going to have to redo them. And as part of that, a lot of it has to do with their work experience or their 
qualifications previously. Lots of people have lots of great experience and they can say that on their CV, but they can't back it up in terms of paperwork for a migration journey. So the government and the different authorities along the way might need different bits of evidence in order to be able to tick the box across and move you through the process. The other thing that I find tends to take a long time is for, so apart from work experience, any anyone that has maybe a difficult family situation, if you have um, a previous partner and children with that partner and you're wanting to bring those children with you or even when you're not, there are certain processes that need to be done in order to allow for you to migrate. So whether your family, your children are coming with you or not, Sometimes they need to do police clearances or medicals, depending on their age. And if you've got a partner, an ex-partner who doesn't want to assist in that process and puts roadblocks, that can stop you from being able to move easily or at all. So there's a lot of things to consider. Sometimes it's not just you as a single person. There's all the people within your immediate periphery as well that are affected and, and their lives affect what you're able to do as well. So when we do our full assessment, we go through a lot of, we ask a lot of questions. We're asking for details of you, your partner, your children. All of this is really, really important because it affects your timelines and what you can and can't do, and then also when. Yeah, okay. I'm noticing some quite specific questions um, on the chat. Look, we can't answer them all in, the, in, this, in this format. It's a little bit challenging to, to drive down deep. But um, someone has asked, look, uh, offshore 189 and 190 invitations, uh, um, when are they expected to pick up? I mean, do you have a view on that, Nazim? What's actually happening in um, with Australian immigration generally? I mean, I know that Canada, for example, is, you know, really um, wanting to lure migrants, but Australia is very much so as well. So um, are there any changes afoot? Yeah. So definitely the 190 is moving along faster, which is why even those who did qualify under the 189 are looking for state sponsorship in order to move that timeline up for them. The various states have announced over the last several weeks the introduction of additional occupations that they'll sponsor from offshore, New South Wales, um, Western Australia, sorry, South Australia has done that. Western Australia, you know, will also look at it depending on whether or not you have a potential offer of employment. There is still also the other pathways to get into the country to apply uh, onshore via well, the borders are open. Um, you can go as, for a holiday. You can, with the job offer, go for a 482. They've removed the, the limitation on only certain occupations entering. And so you've got all these additional pathways available to you. The Australian government's been very, very clear that they want to get skills on the ground and they want to keep the skills that are there as well. So as well as the states adding these additional, I guess, opportunities for people offshore, the Australian government, <clears throat> excuse me, has also announced that anyone that is onshore that was under a visa subclass that didn't traditionally have a PR pathway under the 482 or if they're on the short-term list, they've said, don't worry, we're going to find a way to keep you here. We're going to extend visas we're going to announce additional policy where we're, we're putting the legislation through and then you'll also have a pathway. So I think we're in this period of change and we're seeing a lot of rapid change. And so uh, sometimes we're doing an assessment and we're preparing it and we're sending it to someone. But by the time we're having that follow-up chat, there's further changes that we've discussed because there are changes that are being made by the, the various governments. So there's, there's actually quite a lot happening. Um, but we can see that it's a move towards everyone being allowed back in um, under the odd sort of traditional pathways that we used to see. Okay, thank you. Uh, have we lost Anita here? I was just going to ask her a question, actually. Uh, oh, no, she's coming back. Uh, well, um, welcome back, Anita. I was just, <laughs> just going <laughs> to... Sorry, I had a power surge and my computer just went dead. <laughs> um, Look, there are a lot of people on this webinar that are in South Africa, but there's also people from the UK and other parts of the world. I mean, it costs to migrate, right? So, you know, what's the discussion around that? We don't want to hide away from the fact that um, we charge fees, but also that's actually in the big picture a nominal part of the entire process. 
do you want to run through you know the big money thing and how how you um, describe that to people who are on the webinar? Yeah, so um, um, I spent quite a bit of time talking to South Africans about that because we are quite sensitive to the fact that our currency is weak, and um, and what I find is that most people realise that they will have to save up. And as Nassim has said before as well, you know, you have to plan properly for it. So I find that the time frame here is I do have people that has already thought about it long ago and has saved for it. But most people realize that it's going to take them anything from eight to nine months, maybe a year uh, about saving up doing this. And as I said before, it's like any major project needs a major plan and a major plan needs a budget. So we spend quite a bit of time talking about budgets and I'm very open and upfront and honest with them is that we transparent about the costs, you know, that we charge and we open about the costs that you have to pay to the Australian government. And people are very aware of that. Um, the encouraging thing is, is that uh, people are so serious about it that they are prepared to take the time to save up or plan for it, and be it selling some assets or cashing in some policies or whatever, but um, people are very aware of the fact. And I don't think it's so much of a barrier, more it is of just a, a planning phase, you know. It's not like people saying, oh, I can't afford this, because I, most people know that this is not a cheap journey, you know. it's it's uh, You need to plan for it financially, as Nassim, you have to plan for it in your preparation, in your paperwork. So... I think that's quite encouraging to see that people understand that um, and that they need to just be patient and stay focused. And, uh, and if, as we always say, where there's a will, there's a way. Look, uh, and, and then once you're in Australia and hopefully you're earning Aussie dollars, then uh, some of that uh, expense that you've incurred, you can, you know, you can pay back and, and um, start enjoying the Aussie life. Uh, Brett, you know, from a from an employment perspective, do you have any tips for any people around, you know, how to apply to employers? Even though we would not be recommending that now, uh, you really want to be getting your migration pathway organised first. But what are the sort of things that people can be thinking about now uh, in order to present themselves as best as possible? Yeah, absolutely. Look, one of the first things I'd say, Scott, I know we sort of touched on this today, is you know, see, you want to get your visa look at that, look at the pathway you're coming down here on because it is complex and at least have that sort of roadmap in place. Um, what we do see is a lot of people that simply just send out a lot of applications. They jump on a job board into Australia. It's a big no. People often look at your CV and they just see you from overseas and that, that's probably where it'll end. Um, unfortunately, it's just not a really good pathway um, to doing it. So you really want to do your visa prep. Look at how you're going to get in. What, once you're ready to start having those um, conversations, course, have some dates in place. Uh, you know, how, how are you going to get down your visa, dates in place, this is your roadmap, and be able to have those conversations because you really only get sort of one chance. You don't want to be that CV that just keeps showing up in that employer's inbox um, all the time. That, just, that, that won't hold well for you in terms of marketing yourself to the Australian market. Um, basic stuff, obviously, once you have that, have your CV in place with, um, you know, your relevant work experience. Um, and, yeah, look, start doing some research on potential employees you'd like to work for. In Australia, look, Australia's a massive country. Um, I do have a lot of people come to me and go, I don't know where I'd want to live in Australia. Um, I'm pretty flexible. That's that's pretty huge, to be honest. You really want to do some research into locations and where you want to look uh, because that would be a big part of that job hunt process for you is looking at those geographical locations if people say look I'm flexible anywhere that could be from you know Sydney to somewhere in the Northern Territory so we, you know people will need to know a little bit more and you put a bit more thought into where you want to live and work in Australia so your location have your CV in place you know look at your visa status and have those dates um, for Australia those would be my main points. Yeah, look, the employment market can be quite brutal, can't it? I mean, you, you, I guess what you're saying is you need to position yourself so that you're you're not a problem to the employer, that you're presenting yourself so that you're a, a benefit to the employer um, and applying too soon or with a whole lot of caveats. Um, it's just, it's just, it's just going to be too hard, really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's dead right. So, 
Mm. So it I can be it. done. Absolutely can be done. You know, there's definitely a need for people here. Mm. Um, it's just, you know, there's just, you need to have a bit of a strategy um, to go about getting a job down here as well. Yeah. Look, I, um, I would love to talk about this a little bit more because I, I feel that um, with some of the questions we can get down to some more detail, but it's uh, only two minutes to go. It's 9.40 in South Africa. It's getting on in the UK and people want to get on to their, their evening. So um, just a quick wrap, wrap up from you, uh, Anita. Any last comments? Um, yes, I just want to just say that I'm, I'm here for South Africans. Um, as I said, you do that first little um, inquiry form with us and you can get hold of me and let's have that um, consultation and, and let's speak, take it up from where we are now and talk some more about it. So please give me a call. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and if you're not from South Africa, you want to speak to somebody, we have other consultants, Paul, Simon, Monique, um, who can also talk to you once you've done that initial assessment. So, uh, and then Nazim, I mean, you're at the cold face talking to people all day, every day, unlocking their dreams. Any advice, any final words, please? If you are committed to the move, find out if it's even possible for you. Um, once, you've, once you've got the details, you'll have a, you can then build the plan as, as um, Anita said. So part of our formal um, assessment and review includes all the steps and costs that you're going to have to consider. Once you have that, then you'll know whether you're going to push ahead or not. Kind of obvious in a way, isn't it? <laughs> Just a little. Yeah, it's, uh, it becomes very obvious to us when we um, meet a lot of people that have gone down the right, wrong path. So, look, if there's one message today, is get prepared, complete that eligibility assessment. We're happy to give you a free assessment initially, um, and then you know, you know, you know, you know your pathway, and that actually, uh, that single thing does give people in our experience a huge amount of motivation and a huge amount of momentum to know that you can move, to know what that means. And as Brett said, you know, well, if it looks as though you can come in on the 189, but it's just for South Australia, um, for oh, example, no. the buzz of being able to go, right, let's look at South Australia. Let's, let's look at Adelaide. Let's understand this. You know, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of thrill in future planning for yourself and for your family. Um, and look, so there's just a lot of energy in, in, in taking that next step. And that's all we suggest you do. So on that note, it's bang on um, 9.40 in, in South Africa. So we'd like to say good night uh, to everybody. And thank you very much for joining us. And we hope to hear from you. And we hope to work with you. And we hope to see you in, in Australia. So goodbye. Good evening, everybody.